Hey, hey, hey. How is everybody doing? Welcome to another live stream. I'm going to be saying that soon for the third year consecutive. Every single Monday, 7 o'clock GMT or whatever the term may be now. Okay, I've got a fantastic chat for you tonight. We're going to look at hill training. That's hill, not hell, although some people may refer to it as hell. But the thing is, I'm going to put it in a way that's going to allow you to break it down into five sections, allow you to look at the way that we loop in terms of creating an outdoor training session for hills, but also how we'll look at performance, we'll look at testing, we'll look at everything possible on a hill. But the most important thing, we will relate it to your life. We will make a personality test. Yes, coach, will we? Yes. I'll share with you even a short little personality test I did with junior athletes. Something so simple that you'll be able to relate to inside this chat and see if you pass or fail. I mean, this is a super, you know, identity crisis that we're going to go through. Now, also, what we're going to do is we're going to throw around some elements of your training that you may not have thought of before and we'll be able to package it up and you'll be able to take forward some ideas that you'll find quite incredible, may blow your mind, okay? And I'm going to share a couple of things as well. This is the first live stream where we're going to talk about the new community. In fact, I'm so excited about this community. I'm going to call it a movement. Yes, I'm going to call it a movement. Power to the people. The people who are willing to face up to the struggle, the face up to the challenges that fitness brings us. And inside that community, you've got the option to become a free member. Yes, I'm that excited about it. Hey, join in the chat if you are live. Where are you joining from? Yeah, are you new to the chat? What are you expecting to find inside this chat? Have you got any questions? Well, save them for the end because we want to go through a few things before we get to the question. I want to create a, a starter and a main course before we get into the dessert. So relax. If you're catching on catch up, catching on catch up, is that such a thing? Then just listen, bear with me. Let me go through a few things with you, okay? So if you want to do the usual things, sign up, join me on my various platforms. There they are. Have you subscribed yet? We're about 100 followers short of 47,000. People often ask me, YouTubers, much bigger channels than me. Why is your channel so small? I use YouTube mainly just as a live. As you know, those of you who have followed me for a while, we jump on these sessions. However, I am listening to your questions and your feedback and you want to see more content in terms of shorter videos, etc. Elements from this expanded into a little bit more detail. I am listening, people, but I am a coach, okay? I am not a YouTuber. If I was a YouTuber, I would challenge Jake Paul to a fucking fight, okay? And I'd beat him up. <laughs> Featherweight versus the heavyweight. I'd give him a good scrap, okay? Because if it's not a proper boxing match, then it's not proper rules, is it not? Anyway, I'm only joking, but <laughs> the day I decide that I'm a YouTuber, I'll wear a fancy t-shirt and a baseball cap, and yeah, I'll come on dancing and all singing. Anyway, look, you're here for cycling chat, okay? And that's what we're going to do, right? So, let's jump in and talk about this element that I, I said at the start. The hills we climb are life. Now, what if I was to say to you, how's your life? You ever seen Train Spotting? Yeah, choose life. <laughs> choose hills. But what I mean by that is, before we jump into some of the components, I want you to think right now, before I maybe persuade you to look a different direction, hills are something that all cyclists either love or hate or have a love-hate relationship with, depending on how we feel, how fatigued we are. Also, they are life. They are the headwind, steep gradient into the rain, those tough times that life throws at you. 
a hill or a mountain pass may take you an incredible long time to get up. The struggle, every gradient, every hairpin bend, every headwind gust that hits you, okay? But when you get to the top, it is worth it. It is worth it, not just for the view, but for the effort, for the pat on the back you can give yourself. However, as you freed wheel down the other side of the hill or the mountain, it is over in a flash, in the click of a finger, there is another hill. And that is life, my friends, it's a grind. It is a grind every single day. But the person who embraces and loves the grind, they can really revel in the reward. They can revel in the view. They can revel in what's on the other side of that hill. And you and I are special. We share a common bond. We don't share age. We don't share FTP. We don't share VO2. We share the grind, the love affair that we have with the struggle. And that struggle unleashes a power, a power inside you that takes you beyond the normal realms of the comfort zone, the couch zone that most people live in, okay? That separates us and that is a gift, that is a special gift and when you come and join me in my new community, that is where we will set the fuse alight on our new movement because that power that you have, it is untapped. It is like fucking TNT that's been shoved up your ass because when you go on a bike, whether it be indoors, outdoors, in the rain, in the sunshine, in South America, New Zealand, the UK, Central Europe, fucking Antarctic, it doesn't matter. We share this bond that we wish to push ourselves. Now, some of you get confused and you have to put an event or a race to justify why you train, but it is a process. And it's a process that soon you sign up to and you realise it's lifelong, you will benefit greatly in all areas of life, relationships, professional, social, economic, whatever it is that's underachieving in your life right now, it should not happen because you have a gift to push yourself outside your comfort zone. So I don't want to hear anyone say, I'm shit at climbing hills. I'm better at going down them. I'm not designed to go up hills. You are designed to embrace the struggle, okay? That's important. So let's dive in. You got it? Okay, coachy, let's go. Okay, let's break things down into various forms. I want you to get used to the idea of the basic loop, the basic hill loop, okay? Now, you can watch this uh, video back and I will be breaking it down into little chunks. So the basic hill loop is all about that one loop that you can create that allows you to create both skill and task driven behavior. Now this is super important because when we climb, there are certain changes that will happen, one, in our position on the bike and we must dive into that. And we must understand that there are changes that we should listen to, okay? And then there's changes that we can work on. And these are all obviously to do with the gradient, the weight that we are carrying, the cadence that we need to then do, the body position that we sit in. So obviously as a bike fitter, I will say to people, obviously you have one diaphragm muscle, two lungs, one diaphragm. The diaphragm sits in a position where it can be obstructed if you have got a large belly. Okay, so if you've got a large belly and you moan about your position, guess what? It's not your bike fitting, it's your belly, but you're going to do something about that. Of course you are. Now, I'm not being harsh, I'm not being cruel. This is something that will affect your breathing. So if you lean forward, boom, you're causing issues on your diaphragm. So when we climb, we want to have a high chest. If you join me in the live sessions that we do, the workouts, I talk about that sit up high position, high position, increase the diaphragm, the thoracic capacity, because when we breathe in, the diaphragm flattens. That takes in more air. It's very, very important. Now, your intercostal muscles that work between your ribs, okay, lift the ribs up and out when we breathe in. Coach, this is basic junior school science, okay, but understand that, that breathing 
is a should have its own zones. Your breathing should have zones to train. Most people think of zones as only the power that we're riding at. Zones are only a stimulus an impact on the neural system that's going to have an impact on your cardiovascular system, your skeletal system, etc. Right? So, when you're out climbing, how is your breathing? Are you like someone, okay, on the phone, panting as if you are some sort of weirdo? Hi there. Don't do that, coach. That's a little bit awesome. But there's, there's one in every group. Every group I've been in, there's always someone who's panting, yeah, like, <laughs> he's up to no good at the back of the, uh, the you know, the, the, the bunch. But you've got to relax. Now, normally with that breathing, as soon as your breathing is out of control, you tense up. As soon as you tense up, you tense up your upper body muscles. This restricts the kinetic flow of energy and makes it much more difficult for you to, one, flush out lactic acid and also have that smooth efficiency on the climb. Now, most of you are saying, that's fucking easier. All I do is I put it into what we might term the granny ring, the smallest gear you've got at the first sign of anything that resembles something steeper than a speed bump on the road. But that's the wrong way to do it, okay? So, when you're practicing on your basic loop, this is a loop that's close to home that you know has got a couple of climbs in it, right? And you can do this loop and you can set it up as a time that it takes you to do and you can have the hills as certain parameters. And we'll talk about that when we look at testing. But this, this loop is well known to you and, you, and you know the hills. By knowing the hills, you know the gradients, you know the corners, you know how long it takes. And I'm not talking about a, a 30 second lump on the road, okay? I'm talking about something that's gonna take you a few minutes to climb, something that's, that's realistically challenging. It gets you onto the power curve of beyond two minutes, okay? Now, the breathing and your position. So what you're trying to do is open up your chest cavity, come forward, put your hands, as I say in the, the studio, Billy Joel, you should be able to play the piano. You maybe hold the bar with the palms of your hand. There is no need to go onto the brakes if you're climbing, unless you're on EPO and you're going round faster than Lance Armstrong with two Duracell batteries up his arse. You don't need that, okay? So relax. You steer the bike with the palms of your hand. Oh, you can't do that. Well, your bike's too big for you. Okay, oh no, that's another video. Don't say that, coach, please. I've just spent $5,000 on it. <laughs> that was a question I got today. Mm, not a nice one. Anyway, this relaxed position. And then what you're trying to do is, can you keep your normal cadence? Oh, here's the old question. Oh no, I tend to grind up them. Why? Grinding creates friction, which uses a lot more fuel. So maybe the sign that you need to change if you're riding for two hours or three hours and suddenly your legs are absolutely pasted even though you've been eating. Mm. Okay, so trying to keep a normal cadence that allows you to cut down on the torque and achieve power through velocity, i.e. the cadence. Okay, now there is a position that we use for strength development on the hills when we decrease the cadence and we increase the strength through the gearing. However, here's your test and that's your ass. If your ass starts to shake and grind like Beyonce, half time in the super, the super, I was going to say the, uh, yeah, it was the Super Bowl, wasn't it? She did that, uh, put my ring on your finger or something else. I don't know what it was. Is that rude? Yeah, probably. But you know what I mean? You're grinding away, okay? Boom. That means that the gearing is too much and you're probably going to lean more in your dominant side. And after that ride, you're probably going to have one side of your ass, your glute. God, that's a bit sore today. That's why. As soon as you start grinding away, what happens is your lumbar will then kick in to try and stabilize your pelvis. Remember, your brain's picking up a sign that your ass is moving and it doesn't want that. It wants to stabilize. Posture support. So we talked about breathing, position, gearing. And on this basic loop, you use this as a practice. And then what you do in the basic loop, if the basic loop is all you've got, you've only got a few hills, what you do is you start to set task-driven behavior for your hill training. And that is altitude. Altitude, because what you will do is use the loop, maybe you do it twice, maybe you do it three times, maybe you'll start to introduce some training and we'll do hill repeats, but we'll talk about that in a second. You start to increase the altitude on your basic loop training. 
So have a look at your Strava, have a look at your local area. What is your basic loop? Maybe for you it's a two hour loop, maybe it's a one hour loop, maybe it's got a thousand feet of climbing, maybe it's got a thousand meters of climbing, okay? Maybe you live in a flatter area. You have to travel a little bit for a basic loop. Maybe you have to drive the car over a few main roads, park up and then do a drive. There are lots of options available, but everybody can normally find at least one hill. It may be really dull for you. You have to go up and down it a few times, but you start to set task behavior. So you're going to climb a thousand feet, then you're going to do 2000 feet. So in Scotland, the highest mountain is Ben Nevis, roughly about four and a half thousand meters. Now I'm quite fortunate. I live in an area whereby I can have climbs that average between 1,000 and 1,500 feet on my doorstep. But I do like doing hill repeats, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But you can do it, okay, because you embrace the struggle. So think of the basic loop as the skill element. If you've never looked at a hill in terms of skill, then you need to. Your cadence, your positioning, the way you hold the bar, and the way you breathe, okay? We've got to work on that. Now, something that I want to dip into every aspect is embrace the hill, enjoy, try and stretch yourself on the hill. So you can do a two hour ride that has two or three climbs. Those two or three climbs can start to become test elements, okay? Right, let's move on to what I would call the training hill loop. So the training hill loop is exactly taking the basic loop, but then starting to look at things like your power curve. So let's say your hill gives you a, a two or a five minute duration period. So you may have a two, three hour ride, but inside the ride, you're gonna have power curve tests and you're gonna use them on the hill. So you would set that up as a harder effort and you would then test yourself. Maybe you've got the hill on Strava, maybe you're measuring your performance on that hill and you're trying to create the task orientated behavior into some really key focus to measure and review how your fitness is coming along. And this can be really, really rewarding, uh, maybe done on a weekly basis or a bi-weekly or a monthly basis where you go into this loop. You should have a number of loops that you can go outside of your house and you know exactly almost to the minute how long they take, because this is crucial in managing the key aspect of your training volume, which is time and not distance. A lot of people actually avoid hills. I had a conversation with a few riders and they said to me that they will normally do Zwift rides that are flatter because they get more distance and distance is the metric that they're chasing per week. What a load of bollocks, okay? It's time because training is what? It's a stimulus. Now true, if you go longer distance, you'll increase your time, but it doesn't take into account intensity. Time in every zone is a key metric, not your distance, okay? But altitude allows us that ability to develop strength and find increasing zones much easier than a lot of people, especially lighter riders like myself on the flat, okay? So the hill is your friend. So in that training loop, start to look at one particular hill that possibly offers you a power curve data if you use power. If you don't use power, it offers you a time check particular Strava. And also it's weather dependent, whether it's a headwind or a tailwind, but obviously you can, you know, use your own common sense with that. Now also in your training loop, you can then add more distance to these hilly loops and you can start to set metrics, but start to set some really challenging metrics. Like I've just said to you, the highest mountain in Scotland is only four and a half thousand feet. So maybe you set yourself all right, okay, today's ride, I'm going to aim for over 4,000 feet. Okay, that, that's still a big challenge on a ride, but you start to set some metrics that you can make and you can make some, you know, really identifiable connections. Everybody talks about Everesting, okay? But, you know, to go from very little climbing to such a challenge as that can be too much. And again, a lot of people who start training, you're not actually fit enough to start blocks like that, okay? And we've talked about that before about fiber recruitment, okay? So make sure there's a difference between a basic loop and a training loop. The basic loop is more focused into skill, but the training loop develops on the skill and gives us a sharper time on some of the hills. Then we move to what we call the progress, the hill loop, okay? 
And when we progress Hill Loops, this is whereby we would start to look at uh, adding in a specific efforts. Now, I, I want to talk about two in particular. One is the Hill Repeat and one is the Hill Surge. So what we're looking to do on a Hill Repeat is, as it says, you're going to use a section of the hill and you're going to repeat it because it gives you either the distance or it gives you a particular hairpin that's important to you for an event or it gives you a gradient that's important to you but it offers you a resistance area and you don't have to go too far. My own, during the pandemic, I could find a hill that was very, very steep, over 20% in some sections, and it was within five kilometers from my house, and I could go up and down it no problem, and I could do 12 reps and have 5,000 feet. So it was a really, really good hill and close to the house for training. Have you got that ability to do that? Now, a lot of people say, oh, it's really, really dull and boring, but if you're wanting to improve your hill riding or your strength, then I promise you, it is the best way, okay, because you'll learn all of the basics from the basic and the training inside one effort. Now, the most popular effort that I use is what we call the hill surge. And this is an effort whereby you've got a longer hill, and there's several ways to do this. And it's, if you've ever been abroad, say, on a training camp, or you've been on a holiday, you may come across particular pro sections on say, for me in Europe, we may go to places like Mallorca or around about the Costa Blanca area and you'll come across training camp loops, maybe minutes or two minutes that some of the pros have gone on Strava. Now what they're doing is they're testing, but they're, all, they're doing some lactic testing on the hill, but they're using certain sections of the hill, maybe a hairpin, maybe a particular gradient, and they're going flat out. Now what we want to do on the hill is is create small sections. Now you don't have to be that clean, but what you want to do is to have a good tempo effort where you're going up the hill and then you want to insert, like we do with the purge efforts I talked about, whereby we surge and we create this purge effect. And we may surge for 10, 20, 30 seconds. You may be out the saddle and you may be pushing maybe a high VO2 max power. You sit back down and you carry on the climb until you have recomposed your breathing in a good postural position and then you surge again. And in a, any particular hill, you only really need a minimum of a, let's say a three minute hill. I have done this on three to four minutes and you can get a good three or four surges inside this hill. Now this is a really good way to take a standardized VO2 session on an indoor trainer and put it outdoors. And it will transform your strength and fitness and your confidence on the hills because you've got to get out the saddle and you've got to kick. Now, a good way to do this is obviously you can do it solo, but if you've got somebody else, a little training partner, you can do it with as well. You can set off at different times. It can be really, really rewarding. Now, I am going to share a couple of videos on one particular area that I do this on and show you how this can work. Now, when you're out now, going back to, say, your training loop or your basic loop, you can now look at the hill and you think, hmm, okay, I know this, this bit is steeper, so I can attack this bit, sit down, practice my breathing, get it back under control, and then go again. There are so many things that you can do on the hill. Now, another way to do the surge effort is just to take a hill and let's take the hill repeat and you ride for one minute as hard as you can up that hill. I mean, you give it everything you've got. When you hit the minute, you leave a mark on the road. Now, it's not vomit, okay? You may leave a mark on the road with a small stone or a, you know, usually round about some villages where I live, it would be a piece of litter, wankers. But what you do is you make that mark and then for every single repeat, you roll back down, you hit that mark. You have a little look at your clock. How slow are you getting? Can you get there inside a minute? Now, another good way is to do it for 50 seconds and then you give yourself a minute to hit it every time. So you ride for 50 seconds, boom, where's the mark? Go back down, get it at a minute. And that's all you're doing. You're just doing that one little section because 
it's the equivalent of the VO2 minutes that you do indoors. You extend the hill, maybe you do 90 seconds. You got the idea and you roll down. So you're using the gradient to increase the gravity pull so you can get those higher powers. It can be very, very rewarding. And then you can set up a training session whereby you sit, stand, sit, or you sit all the way. So one little golden rule I would say, let's say you're watching this and you're a time trialer. You want to then try and put your climbs into a sitting position. So you're choosing something that's maybe around about that three, four, five percent gradient that you can do sitting down. As soon as the gradient increases, a lot of riders will either grind or they will have to stand up. But when you stand up, that's when you want to attack. You want to put that high stimulus into the body so that you are maximizing your VO2. Okay. Now, obviously, it's, you know, swings and roundabouts to whatever particular event you're training for. But I'm talking about somebody who's looking to improve their general fitness using a hill to boost VO2, to boost muscular strength, to boost absolute power. Now, that little workout is, it works really well if you're in a pair and you have someone sort of wait around that area where they think that you're going to hit in a minute and they time you and you make that mark and then you hit it every time. And that's all you need to do. And that mark stays there forever. You leave a piece of rock or something at the side of the road or you visualize it and you know exactly where it is and that becomes a mark you can use for the next month, for the next few months. And then maybe you make another one or when you do your surge efforts, you know exactly on the corner, the gate, the tree that you're going to do your surges between. I love to use road signs. I love to use little lines on the road. And I like to do ones whereby I'm going into a hairpin and attacking out. Remember, if you're a lighter rider like me, a hill is something that you should excel at. So a lot of people will say to me, oh, I struggle on hills even though I'm quite light. No, you don't. You just don't maximize them as much. So if you want to get the most out of them, you've got to use them. That is your battlefield. Because the big, stronger rider who's a good TT rider is going to catch you on the downhill possibly or get you on the flat. So on the hills, you make it super hard. Yeah. So those workouts, they work really well. Now, what about the performance hill loop? So we've worked on our our skill level, we've worked on our breathing, the way we hold, we've created tasks in terms of altitude, we've now then, and say a few weeks in, we've created training sessions of hill repeats, we know exactly what hill we're going to use for that, we've got little sections before we go out in the ride, right, I'm going to attack there, that's going to give me a two minute, I'll measure that against my, my, my power curve, I'm going to do a five minute, I'm going to do a 10 minute effort here, this hill offers me 20 minutes, great. Now, the performance, okay, this is where we dial down into things like power to weight. So power to weight is an anomaly. It is a ridiculous uh, conundrum for riders because standing in your birthday suit, weighing yourself, sucking in your belly is, is an indication of where you are as a health metric, not as a cycling metric. As I shared the other week, when I weighed in and then clothed up, with winter gear, shoes, overshoes, tools, and then onto the bike, there was a difference of about 13 kilograms. So your real power to weight is what you weigh with everything on, including the bike, because you have to shift the bike up the thickin' hill, okay? So if you lose a kilogram of timber from the body, okay, that's great. Every kilogram you lose from your body, I want you to think of it as around about a thousand to $1,500, because that's what it would cost you to decrease that weight on your bike, at least. So rather than go trying to shave weight off your bike or buy a new bike, reduce the size of your gut, okay? Because it's costing you money to keep it that size, and it's costing you money if you want to then purchase the bike. But what you want to do is maybe experiment. Start to weigh yourself. Naked, clothing, clothing and bike. See what the difference is. Then start to look and see if anything makes any difference in terms of changing that power to weight. Maybe taking out less tools. Maybe taking out or shaving down some of the weight. Okay? Because it and see if there is a difference. Start to look at your position. Okay? 
on the bike. Now, when it comes to hills, aerodynamics is, is not something that we focus on because you want to keep a high frontal load. And what I mean by frontal load is the triangle that's created between the hands and the head. So this position is high when we're climbing. Why? Because we want to open up the diaphragm and we want to have this ability. Because remember, all movement has an efficiency score in terms of how much oxygen it requires you to move. One meter, two meters, three meters. Oxygen is required for the fueling. So it's really, really important that we keep the key fuel as an oxygen in the system. So don't be thinking, I'll go a little bit quicker if I go aero going up that hill. If you're going aero up the hill, it's not really a hill for you, okay? It's not really taxing enough. But think of elements as you move forward. If hills are something you struggle with, okay? One thing I'm always amazed about, and I'm sure there's no one on this chart, that people don't check their tyre pressure every time they go out on their bike. You should be checking your tyres every time you go out. Every single time. Even if they haven't changed, you still check them, okay? And you're trying to maybe experiment then with some tyre pressure. Because it does have a difference. Now, when it comes to aerodynamics, we'll do some chat on that. And we'll definitely be doing it in the new community. And I'll show you some gains or losses that can be made. Not particularly through pressure, but particular types of, of tyre that you may be using as well. But the thing is, look at your performance. Look at how you feel going into rides when you're climbing. What happens to you later on if you grind away on those first climbs? Let's say you've got a peak power above 1,000 watts. Now, that's a rough guide for men, around about 850, 800 for women. Over 1,000 watts means you've got slightly more fast twitch fibres than the average person. Not a huge deal. If you're over 1,200 for a man and over 1,000 for a woman, you've got a lot more. If you're over 1,400 for a man and over 1,100, 1,200 for a woman, you're in the higher, higher ends. That means that you're more likely to grind away. You use a bigger gear because you find that a little bit more economical. You've probably got a lower cadence. So in those earlier hills, you probably grind away at them. But you've got to remember that even in your zone two, you're consuming a lot more fuel than somebody who's a lot lighter, with less peak power, more fast, twi uh, more slow twitch fibers activated. Okay? So people often say to me, oh, they go up a hill faster than me, but they're bigger than me. It's, it's different stages in the, the ride and obviously how you fuel. Because... Too many people wait too late if they've got hills in the first hour or 90 minutes. And suddenly at the end, no matter how much they feel, their legs are on fire. This is to do with friction, okay, that you've created. So if you grind away in your cadence, all cadence is variable, remember, on an outdoor ride. It will change. But if you can try and keep that transition of cadence smoother on the flat to the hill, you will perform better on hour three and hour four. Try it. And what I mean by that transition is if you've got a 85 to 90 cadence on the flat and it drops to 65 to 70 on the hill, try and keep it at that 85, 90 on the hill. What gearing does that allow? I don't want to hear that you can't breathe because the cadence is too high. That's because you need to then make some changes to your training. Remember, he who does the same and expects different results is a fucking loony, right? Yeah, lock them up, coach. Lock them up. Okay, if you're still on, then uh, have you hit that like button yet? Come on, over 100 people watching live, come on, do something good today. Now, I've got one more that I want to uh, mention with you, and this is something that I started with, and that's the mindset hill loop. So, I'll hear people, okay, oh no, I've got to go up that hill, oh, why have we got this hill, oh, there's a headwind with this hill. I want you to look at life itself. Today when we're going live is Monday. Monday for a lot of people, we talk about things, the Monday blues, we've had a nice weekend, maybe you return to work, etc. You get 16 to 18 hours to live and then you reset that day if you're lucky. Okay? I, I, I'm not an old hippie. That's the truth. Far too many people fuck about with their days and don't maximise them. And you certainly mess about with your riding. You, have you ever been injured? Okay, you ever had a crash on your bike? You ever had a crash so bad that you, you couldn't go on your bike for maybe several weeks, several months? How did that feel? 
So when you're out on your bike, never ever take your eye off the prize. Never ever take it for granted. Never ever, because there will be a day where you can't do it. So what we have is the same concept I talk about the tough workout, the hard workout, the test, the FTP test you've got to do, who will suffer from pre-test anxiety. What we want to do is we want to convert that into love, into excitement, into, wow, is this what it's like? Because it's the reward you get from the adaptation. If you do not go into the fire, you won't get the experience of what it feels like. Now, I know that sounds a bit strange, but we've got to go into the eye of the storm to actually experience it. Why? Because you love the struggle. Don't kid on that you don't. Don't lie to yourself that you'll just pick and choose the little fights, okay? Thou is not afraid of anything apart from ice. I don't like ice on my bike, but I will battle spiders head on. <laughs> I will take on Jake Paul. There's a call out to Jake Paul on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. I'll take him on. But too many people avoid. Okay. So I've got particular routes and I bet you you have as well. That you may be going home. You've had a hard ride. Maybe you've had a group ride and you're the last one and you leave everybody and you've got a couple of miles to go home. I'll always say to someone, can you go one more minute? Can you add another street? Don't take the shortest route home. Go a different way. Extend your cool down. But is there a hill that you avoid? Or you maybe even take a longer route home because you just don't want to go up it. You should embrace every opportunity to lean into something that's difficult because you will come out the other side stronger. So having that anxiety or that dread or that fear or that oh, huffy teenager approach to something that's difficult. You will never move forward. You will set your body, remember we talked about parasympathetic and sympathetic, we need to then get into that fight or flight mode for these efforts. The reward is waiting for you. But if you can convince your mind, this is good, this pain is worth it, you will go further because your head will fatigue before your legs. As soon as you switch off up here, it's over. But you shouldn't be falling into that trap because you're special. You've done hard workouts before. So start to look at your whole thinking approach, your whole training application, your whole route mapping, your route planning, and start to look at things like time and altitude rather than distance as you start to build up strength. But your mind is incredibly important. When we dive into the new community, those of you who come and join me, it'll be something that I talk about every week, sharing experiences of other riders from elite all the way down to beginners. Because we must always remember that we train to improve our health, but without the health, there is no fitness. Fitness is a gift. We're all fit ability to meet the needs of the environment, get out of bed, walk down the stairs, go to work, have a relationship, be a meaningful contributor to my local and wider community. That's fitness. Increasing your fitness so you can ride in a race, that's bollocks. Okay, and you know it is. You do not need to just put everything into one event because let me tell you this, in 30 years of coaching, the volume of riders, even elite riders, that can say, every ride I have in a race is a success. No, it's not, because they maybe win one out of every hundred. What we need to do is to look at the process, the journey, the lifelong association, like an umbilical cord with the workout that we have, okay? Now, that can either be healthy or unhealthy, but it's about the fitness journey that we need to sign up to. And hills are part of cycling. You're given a free gift, a bike, that will generate energy from you. You propel it to areas that some people never see, don't even know. I assure you there is people in your local community, even in your family, in your own town, haven't been on the roads that you have within maybe even five kilometers from their house. I've never been on them. 
don't even know where they are. You know small villages in your county that some people don't even know exist, never mind having been to them. Your cycling takes you to places. If I have ever cycled in a new town, I will never ever get lost when I drive my car. I know where everything is. My bike allows me to open up my senses and take everything in. Sure, I like to ride my bike fast and even at 52 years old. By the way, it's my half birthday on Friday, the 3rd of March. Time of shooting this is the second last day, I think of, where are we, 27th, 28th of February? Yeah, I was introduced, thanks Michaela Culkin for making that little Twitter post about Jake Paul getting punched in the face and celebrating your half birthday. My daughter reminded me it was from Alice in Wonderland. So there you go. I've told all the family I want gifts, I want a cake. Yeah, half birthday. When you go over 50, fuck, you got to celebrate everything, haven't you? Yeah, of course you have. But anyway, I like riding fast. I like racing. But I love nothing more than getting out my bike. I feel like Doctor Who in the TARDIS. Okay? And I can just disappear. Really important. Hey, that's hill training, folks. You got it? Okay, so lots in there. I'll break it down and I will share a couple of little shorter videos from that, but I think that was pretty much evident that the way you approach hills is the way you approach life, but you are making a lie from the truth because if you've done even one hard workout, you've gone to a special place. Remember I talk about the attic space in your head? Around about 15% of unused capacity of effort. Most people don't need to go there because you've never been in a life-death situation and your bike is certainly not that. But if you can just push that extra minute, that extra few miles, that, that extra intensity further than you think you're capable of, boy, do you open up a book of life that you never thought existed. You will gain inner strength, inner confidence in what you do. Okay? So, Cycling should be opening up new opportunities for you as an individual. It shouldn't be shutting them down. Okay, so if you're watching this and you're one of the many people who's contacted me in the last few weeks saying, hey coach, I'm struggling with things like Strava. I'm struggling with posting rides that are a little bit slower. When I go up hills, my average speed goes down. Come on, folks. There is a lot of noises in the world and one of the reasons I'm creating a new community in school is because Facebook is one of them. I don't want to know what you had for your fucking dinner. Like, I, you know, come on, folks. Right? But in the, the new page, you'll meet like-minded people. One gift I have that you may not have is I have seen it. I have communicated with people in every continent on the planet about cycling and I know that there are so many connections of people who want to ride their bike, they want to get fit, they don't necessarily need to have 101 events that they need to enter to justify why they're doing it but they're missing out on so much because they're not communicating why they're doing it. Sometimes they wrestle with it, they're not too sure themselves. I can help you. Oh yes, I can help you etc 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 right folks i think it's about time did anyone see the pinned chat yes we're having a raffle i talked a little bit about it and uh explained the the reasons why how i'm going to be developing a little bit more in the home studio we're going to set it up for more content when we open the new community there's a lot more courses classes live chats all sorts of stuff that we're going to do so i would uh yeah, ask you, hit the link, the link is in the pinned comment and it's in the description at Raffle. Now Raffle is the leading company for raffles, everything's all above board, but you're also going to give 10% to Crohn's and Colitis, the charity I support. Why? Because it's the illness I suffer from, but I still go up hills. And what you're going to get, well you can see the GoPro in the back there, the very first camera I used on YouTube. Yes, I love it, I still use it now. Okay, a bit sad to give it away, but I think it's quite a nice prize. I've got the Ferraguns, we've got the BFR cuffs. Now those BFR cuffs are pretty special because you've got red, blue and yellow. What does that mean? It means it's going to fit everyone, right? So whether you're medium or small, you're going to get cuffs that will work for you inside there. So it's a pretty unique package, probably worth quite a lot on its own. We've got the... Uh, Sirocco sunglasses, we've got the Theracups. People ask me, what are Theracups? You didn't open it up. 
If you've never done, you hear the zap on there. Okay, so. Cupping, okay. So we place this on, and these are, uh, we can have them just as a plain cup, or we turn them on with a little battery, and I mean, this little thing is bloody phenomenal. Hey, hit that link, the tickets are only one pound, and you've got a chance to win around about a thousand pounds worth of gear. Okay, should we move into some questions, folks? Okay. So, if you've got any questions, put a little hashtag. Maybe it's about hill, hill climbing. I do tend to say hell climbing. I know that. Okay. <laughs> but if you've got any questions, pop them in. Okay. And I will do my best to answer them. Let me just close this down. I can see a few folk talking about half birthdays. Yeah, I love them. Question, first TT Saturday. Hey, Stephen, I've got mine on the 19th of March. Uh, first one since pre-lockdown for me. So my first one in the 50s. Planning very easy few days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Do you agree? Uh, let, I've just lost that. And I can't find my... Uh, oh. It's going by too quick. I've lost that. Okay, sorry, it's not letting me slide up. I'm guessing I want you to post that question again. Okay, Franz, question. I heard that the problem with repeated one-to-one -one VO2 max intervals on two steep hills. Why is the bloody thing not allowing me to go back up? Here we go. Okay, let me go back to Stephen first. I've shut down my camera so I can't see myself, but I'm sure you can. Uh, first TT, do you agree, uh, PS, 67 years old and weather now, same as air, thanks. Oh yeah, you're going easy, I got you, I got you, okay, so you're 67 years old, okay. So easy few days, Thursday, Friday, I would say that if it's the first TT, uh, don't fall into any uh, illusions that it's nothing other than a training ride. So why would you change your normal routine? Just maybe have an extra rest day or an activation day, maybe on the Thursday. So I would rest. I would do your normal sort of Tuesday, Wednesday. Rest on the Thursday, okay, which is 48 hours out. Activate, so a small 30-minute activation on the Friday, but open up the tank really hard and then see it as a training session. Maybe ride out to the event and ride it if you can. Okay, that's what I'll certainly be doing on my first one. I'll be riding out to it. It'll be a training session. I'll take all the pressure off me and do it early in the season, okay? Franz, I uh, heard that the problem with repeated one-to-one -one VO2 max intervals on two steep hill is that the spinning is too easy in the downhill. Uh, Franz, I wouldn't worry about the recovery. Uh, you work on the, the work effort, but obviously hill repeats. We used to say anything that's sort of around the 4% is good for hill repeats if you're doing low. When it gets really, really steep, that's where it becomes a problem in terms of, let's say, the gearing, etc. So rather than do them as hill repeats, if it's, say, above 7% and such, there's only maybe small sections of the hill like that. I would like to find something that is in that 4 maybe 5% uh, when I'm doing sort of efforts on it. But in terms of the recovery, what we're talking about is if you're doing short VO2 and you run about the 30 to 40 seconds, that's where the recovery is really important because you're trying to drive up the usage. Remember, there's the central and the peripheral delivery of oxygen. I wouldn't worry too much about trying to do a short effort on a hill. I'd be looking for, you know, that, that type of surge effort really, really, you know, would work. In terms of rolling back down, you're looking more at a strength and a medium to long VO2 effort. That's why I said if you've got something about a three minute length, okay? Hopefully that explains it. Elena, question. Indoors cadence is 90, 95, 85, 90 on hills, but outdoors 75 to 85. This drops to 60 to 65. That's that type of thing, Elena, we're talking about when we grind on the hills. Now, your cadence may drop because obviously when we're outside, we have got the power to wait to move mass and we've got wind and we've got confidence on the moving bike. And this will change, okay, for riders. Experience on the bike, how we handle the bike, how the bike and you move as one. Okay, so, but I would say that if you're able to hold a higher cadence indoors, you're certainly trying to work. But I would say, Elena, the first thing is we look at transitions from the flat into the hill. 
okay? So try not to grind, especially if you've got someone, a loved one, that can video you and not share the content of your ass, okay? But you could look at what's happening and if you are really rocking and grinding away, it's something to think of. Experiment. You could do three hill repeats on a on a fairly moderate hill and you could try different cadences, okay? Or you do that over a period of time. Say on the basic loop that I talked about, over the next three weeks, you take one hill and you ride it at a different cadence each time. And you look at the... the the, the review, say whether it's on the power or how you feel. Hey, tired today. Question, hi Scott, I have a question regarding zone two training. I've noticed that at lower cadence, 80 RPM versus 100 RPM, that the power will be 20 watts higher for the same heart rate. Which should I train at? Okay, so that's quite a complex, there's a lot in there because we're talking about biometrics based on your, say, particular fibre type or what you train at. So you must have a, a cane that you find more comfortable. So what you're trying to do is remember, don't be fooled by a lot of information on the internet that you need a cadence of X. You don't. I've talked before about research. We looked at in the lab when 88 to 92 had a better efficiency through the sweep that helped the float over the top. But everybody is biomechanically preset and you can find pros will have very, very different cadences, but cadence can also be preset to your level of fitness. You're likely to spin the bike slower if you're not as fit as you want to be. Okay, so I would say that you need to dial into what feels natural for you. Okay, and also that extra revving, if it's on, say, an indoor session, it may be more linked, the higher RPM will be linked to a faster heart rate drift because your temperature will rise quicker. So you've got to kind of cater for that as well. So there's a lot in there that, again, I would probably need to know more biometrics. Cupping sounds kinky, Peter. Yeah, this one has not been used uh, for anything that's X-rated. That's my other one, okay? And it has fur around the edge and a couple of pairs of handcuffs as well, Peter. So, yeah, I'm not allowed to share that on YouTube anymore. Yeah, I get into trouble. <laughs> hey, where are we now? Tom, Craig. Is it better to use BFR cuffs for zone two sessions or VO2? BFR is a unique session. It does not link to anything other than that uh, percentage. Remember I talked last week or when we did BFR, around about 65 to 80%. I use 70% of VO2. You can't change, okay? All you do is you change the, the intensity slightly depending on the feel, how you set the pressure, okay? so. That this sometimes become confusing because riders try and hack the BFR stimulus and you can't, okay? You use it for what it is, okay? To create that slightly anabolic uh, anabolic response of a hormone change, etc. So it's a shorter 15 to 20 minute session that has the stimulus of a much harder, longer session. That's it, okay? Uh, Tom, been, have I missed anyone? Tom, been cycling for a year with three to four months break, presuming someone is doing structured training and resting. How long would it usually take before someone would plateau on aerobic fitness base? Wow, years, Tom, years. Okay, it's not going to happen. Even when a pro hits the high level or the maximum in terms of what they call central uh, oxygen delivery, uh, they can still work on the peripheral delivery, and that's things like increasing red blood cells, mitochondrial density, alveoli activation, left ventricle strip. There's so many other things. So, yeah, look, if you've only been cycling a year, it's not going to happen, my friend. You can move your zone two up every single year. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, hopefully, Peter, yeah, hopefully I've answered that. BFR for cardiovascular density is going to create an aerobic stimulus from an anaerobic style workout. It, you know, there's lots of research coming out now on BFR and how it's used. Remember, it was introduced as a product to assist people who weren't going to be able to, say, lift heavy weights, and it was also used as a rehab for injury because it reduced the loading on joints. 
but had the stimulus. All training is stimulus, okay? Uh, Lee, hello coach, do you have any tips to avoid cycling cramps? Unfortunately, I've done a, quite a few videos on this. Your cramp is probably something to do with a weak point on the, the muscle. There is probably overloading on that, maybe through positioning. I don't want to complex things, but we talked a little bit about the sodium potassium pump. So the relationship between those volumes, therefore, what, and the byproduct of calcium and how this creates muscle contractions. So sodium, most people have enough on their diet. Potassium, maybe that's something you look at. And calcium, we've got to keep those elements high. But again, cramp, we know it's linked to fatigue. It's not linked to lactic acid. It's more likely a site or some form of overloading on a particular part of the muscle. And this could be saddle position, your body weight, etc. If you've got it, you've got to make sure you let it heal, massage it out, because it's likely that it could happen again in that point, okay? But yeah, go from the usual things, the minerals, the electrolytes, the hydration, etc. But if it's still happening, Lee, you need to make a slight little change maybe to the loading okay that might be a cleat position change it may be a, a saddle position fore aft or a, or a height okay i can't be any more specific than that because honestly people know more about the surface of the moon than they do about the individual specifics of, of cramp but if you go through those things you may get a relief gets <laughs> nice name if you're a new cyclist would you say a good base would be two, three sessions of sweet spot intervals, long ones with zone two, the rest of the days. I would say, you know, if you're starting, depending on how much you've got, maybe even just one session of, uh, if that's sweet spot, if that's where that's meant, or sub, sub threshold. Remember, there is a difference between sub threshold and sweet spot. Sweet spot is the upper end, so it's just below threshold. So if you're doing two to three sessions of a week like that, I'd say that's too much. I would say if you're new to cycling, you want to continue to build the cardiovascular density and then I would I would avoid sweet spot altogether and go zone five and have VO2 and zone two. Once your zone two becomes a little bit more acclimatized to the training, then introduce one of those sessions into a sweet spot session because that will help move the zone two up. But you want to keep that, that high end. So zone five, zone two, develop the zone two, Boom, build into zone three from there, okay? Taylor Noble, I train one and a half to two hours every morning, Monday to Friday. Good man, that is commitment. But I'm unable to do a three to five hour long ride on the weekends due to schedule. Small kids, wife doesn't like me going uh, that long. Is there another option? No, you don't, you don't need another option. That's fine. Zone two can start to have effect from 30 minutes. So if you're doing one and a half hour rides, then you are really developing your zone two, no problem. I would then create a clean and dirty ride maybe once a week or twice. And what I mean by that is you maybe take one hour for zone two and then the last half hour you rip into a VO2 session and you make the end dirty. And what we mean by dirty is you'll produce lactate. Lactate is a much more accessible fuel than glycogen and fat. At that. So you'll use that. So you're not necessarily improving the efficiency of the mitochondrial. Remember, mitochondrial efficiency works better when it's a mixture almost as equal we can of fat and glycogen. Therefore, the metabolic response of mitochondrial increases and the stimulus via the nervous system activates more mitochondrial. That is a good thing because mitochondrial will use fuel better at rest as well, but it will also improve its metabolic response, which means it clears lactic quicker when it does appear. So it's win-win for you. Don't worry. Don't worry about that long ride. Don't worry about, oh, they say you've got to have that long ride to increase the mitochondrial sites. You do what you can do. You never worry about what you can't do. You maximize what you've got. And what you've got is a great system and a super wife who's keeping you correct. Now, remember, when you're training, it should highlight elements of strength in your life. It shouldn't deteriorate them. So if you've got young kids, that's far more important than any event. But your health is number one because you're a role model to those kids. 
And you've got to be the best husband, then the best dad, then the best athlete. And somewhere in between, there's a job. There's something else to do. So even that takes precedent over your training. But your training is to improve your health, not your fitness. So if you're becoming irritable, if you're becoming sort of intolerable, something is not right with your recovery. So don't go searching for more, search for smarter, okay? Hope that helps, yeah. Marriage counselling is a side business that I do. Please contact me at www.ihatemyfuckingwife.com. Okay, I'm only joking. <laughs> Married 20 years this year. We're going on a cruise. Hmm, can't wait. Okay. Right, where are we? Sorry. John, great video of Mrs. McLean climbing 20% Carrick Hill. Very inspiring. Can you do some more? John, she is so excited. And if I shout loud enough, she may hear me. But, because uh, she's in the next room. But we're going to do more of that. And we're going to take her up. Now, she's going to ride it in flats, not in cleats. And I want to do a video on why that's important. And a lot of people, when you're going on to climbs, please, if you're new in cleats, there is a chance that if you go into something steep in the wrong gear, you may come to a stop very, very quickly. I don't want anyone falling off their bike from this video, okay? But yeah, we're going to do return because that was actually before COVID hit when we did that video. Yeah, she's a new fighting machine now, so she is. Hey, Peter. Great session, coach. Thank you very much. That reminds me. Hey, have you hit that thumbs up button? We've got 98 likes from 100 and so many people on. I can't see how many folk are on. But yeah, come on, let's hit 100, please. Have you subscribed yet? We need 100 to hit 47,000. Come on. Right, okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Gavel Tramp. Get out. Uh, oh, sorry, Peter. Never answered your question. Been practicing... Uh, float on the pedals, I think that is. How can I expand or experiment with it? It makes rides much easier. Fantastic, Peter. Peter, are you in the Patreon group? We're going to do some sessions on that. I'm doing a float session and cadence session in my recovery week this week. Okay, let me know. If not, I'm going to video it and I'll share it. Gravel tramp. Getting out the seat gives some free watts, but shoots up my heart rate for me. Staying seated works as my heart rate remains lower. Your thoughts? It depends, again, what you're training for. If you're wanting to push up VO2 on hills, whereby we're getting out the saddle, getting out the saddle will relieve stress on particular joints. Some people don't like doing it. Heavier riders find it a little bit more difficult. Lighter riders find it a little bit easier. Contador could ride the whole of Alpe d'Huez out of the saddle. Pantani could do the same. Pantani would ride a bigger gear, possibly, than, say, Contador. Okay, but a high cadence out the saddle, it's a skill level as well. But if you're looking to use it as a training session, get out the saddle. Don't fear the high heart rate. Use it, okay? It's a good sign. So it depends, I would say, uh, on what you're what you're using the session for, okay? Okay, Streamlabs. A poll is going on, uh, and this is something that I put uh, for video. Do you want more bike fitting videos, more mindset, more nutrition, or more training videos? Okay, so yeah, I don't know if that poll's coming through or if you can see that because uh, I forgot all about it. Okay, so maybe you can vote. You just vote workouts, mindset, eat, or bike fitting. Cool. Uh, Buona sera. Hey, Gino. Great as usual, thank you. What efforts shall one train on hills that takes six to eight minutes, threshold or sub-threshold? Again, it depends on what you're trying to do because that's a threshold. Anything between, say, eight to 15 minutes, I would be asking a rider if that you, we're doing threshold efforts. If your fitness is at the point where threshold efforts are necessary, do it. It depends on the time of year, the type of where you are in your season, okay? So I would say that if it's early in the season, you're using sub-threshold for that length of time, okay? That makes sense? Now, remember, sometimes in the winter or, say, later winter, because you're not going to go on hills that are going to offer ice or snow, but sometimes it can be easier to go steadier up, say, sub-threshold, and then try and go down harder. This is something that we would try and give for junior riders because this would have a smoother heart rate control. So rather than freewheeling all the way down and getting cold and a really, really low heart rate and then getting the legs going. So there are, I didn't mention that because that, that's more sort of 
higher end training where you're trying to level out things. So if we're doing zone two training, you go a lot softer up the hill and a lot harder down, okay? And that takes a little bit of skill to do as well, but it certainly keeps you warm. Uh, oh, thank you, Taylor. I get so many messages about, and I, I do want to uh, elaborate and get better at YouTube, but I do need help with that. I, I'm an honest guy. I'm very, very uh, forthright in telling you what I'm good at and what I'm bad. I'm a, I'm a coach with lots of experience, but doing the little, the video and stuff, I prefer doing lives and maybe shorter lives is what we're going, okay? But I'm so, I'm so busy with my coaching. Pantani was a mutant. Of course he was. There was many uh, strengths and weaknesses to his personality. And I would be the first one to say there are many strengths and weaknesses to my personality. Okay. And, and as all of us, but we share this common link with this ability to go outside our comfort zone, whether you are a two hour a week amateur or a 20 hour a week plus semi pro pro rider, it doesn't matter. Okay. We share that common thread, that common bond. We are brothers and sisters on this planet through that connection. I would say in many cases, you are stronger bond with your cyclist friend than you are with some of your family. Because let's face it, most of you have got family. You don't want to come round and visit. You're only associated through them, <laughs> through marriage or birth. Yeah. You would rather spend time talking about carbon wheels than you would about who took their first baby snap. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I think we're through, yeah? Okay, Tom, did I see that come in? Uh, Roberto, sorry, missed that. Implementation of Zone 3 session uh, to weekly VO2. Which one first, Zone 3 or VO2 in the week? Good question, Roberto. So I would normally say, if we're looking at breakthrough sessions, you take the key session, which would be the harder session for you so that you're fresher and we can deliver it with a cleaner system. So you might say the VO2 is going to be harder, but it may not be. It may be a shorter effort. You may find them a little bit easier. So position them at the start of the week, depending again that you you know, where you are going to therefore do your longer rides. Tom Barnes, my training plan has some workouts uh, with three hours of zone two rides, 73% FTP with a 10 second uh, out of the saddle max sprint uh, ev every 15 seconds. Curious on your thoughts of mixing zone two and zone seven, eight. Yeah, look, Tom, if you're doing a specific sprint session, the neuromuscular end, you're not going to mix zone two and zone eight. You're not going to think of it like that. It's a specific session to build up the anaerobic response. Yeah. Don't worry about trying to have it with zone two. If you're doing zone two and then neuromuscular workouts, you're doing them at the end. Clean, dirty. Have a long zone two so that you get the benefit that drips into the system. Then do your sprints. If you're doing it from the get-go and you're just interspersing them all the way through the ride, it's not a zone two ride because it's impossible for you to be using fat for fuel, okay? as much as you, what you would want for a cleaner zone two, right? But don't worry about it, you know, you just go with it. Okay, where are we? Uh, Franz, question, is the upper end of zone two better on indoor trainer than the middle? To be honest, it's about a stimulus. Does it matter? If you're moving more towards the upper, it means that you're moving. Remember, if you see a 15 watt change, that's half a zone, you're looking to start moving your FTP up so your zone 2 changes. The ultimate goal is to get a better response in terms of power for that heart rate or that feel. Remember, many people have a very sensitive change to heart rate drift in terms of temperature and they'll only notice it when they go outdoors and they think, my god, this ride feels a lot easier at this particular power, okay? You're always looking at what is the best stimulus for you. There is no right or wrong. The whole aspect of middle and upper zone is more of an ego thing because you're still getting a response in terms of the semi, And that's why zones are so big. But if you're feeling like you're at the upper zone and it's still accommodating, yeah, you're moving forward and it's time to start looking at changing your zones. Uh, hey, Craig, should riders with fast twitch muscles stay away from just doing zone two work? I felt like doing zone two every day, 
made my legs feel sluggish. Okay, that's interesting. So no, I wouldn't say that because, you know, nobody's dominant. You know, you if you're more fast twitch fiber, you know, you're talking about 55, 45. You're not talking about 85% and, you know, it's not going to work that way. If the legs are feeling sluggish, it may be something to do with the friction that you're creating. Are you doing the zone two rides and a big gear, slow cadence? So maybe you're building up friction that you're not accommodating in your recovery period. So I'd, I'd look at that, maybe changing up uh, something to do with how the zone two is either delivered or how it's recovered from, okay? But you're certainly still looking to increase. And also remember what I said, your zone two ride will have an effect on your fueling as well. So you may not feel hungry, but you definitely need to replace. Okay, and get out of that, Anna, you know, what we call the catabolic phase, that the legs feel sluggish. That's maybe something more to do with nutrition, possibly. But again, I'm only hypothesizing. Mr. Smooth, hi, coach, or Bay or Trek. Hey, good question, Mr. Smooth. It's looking like Trek. Trek Madone SLR, Altigra DI2. What do people think? Yeah, is that a good choice? It's what I'm looking at. It's what potentially is in the review stakes at the moment. And guess what, folks? If I go with the Trek Madone uh, SLR, I'll take that DI2, I will be auctioning off my Orbea. Yes, I'll be giving it away. I won't have room for it. Okay, so that'll be a prize coming up. And I've possibly got a whole load. I mean, you want to see some of these bikes that I've got access to that I'll be giving away. Yep, full carbon bikes. We've got gravel bikes. We've got aero bikes. Keep watching. Yep. Uh, are we done? Christian, hi coach, I was diagnosed with a very low B12. It's common, B12, B9, get them into your system, folks. We need them for energy. It's been retested at 160, but the range is 120 to 900. Do you think it's still low for a cyclist? I would say, oh my God, I could talk to you forever about this, about our absorption of nutrients our understanding of what vitamins and minerals that we may take as supplements, but we have got low absorption rates of. So some people need to be taking them. One that I am low for, how do I know? I've been tested, DNA tested as well. That's omega-3, I've talked about that before. So it's a daily supplement for me because I don't absorb it very well from food. I would say, Christian, that that is possibly a genetic factor, a low absorption. So let's get it up. Okay, in the polite way, get it up, yeah. B12. Okay, I would start taking it every day, measure it. Does your diet allow you B12? A lot of modern diets now, I'm not saying what ones are eliminating B12. Okay, yeah, do not pass go. Right, so hopefully that helps. Uh, just keep taking the B12. Yeah, Christian, majority of people have low B12. Yeah, he's correct. Right? It is something that you do see, but there are a number of them. Like I say, omega-3, get on the oil. Yeah? Put it on your bike. Put it down your throat. It's essential if you want to be a goat. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. I think I'm done, folks. How's everybody doing? Yeah? We want to recap on whether you've joined the raffle yet. The link is in the description. Yeah, if you want to support the channel, that's the best way at the moment to do it. If you want to come and join me on the live workouts, come and join me on Patreon. But we're going to be moving everything across to the new platform, School Kinetic. There's going to be a couple of levels. So all of you who are in my coaching packages, yeah, you will get automatically transformed in. But I mean, the free site is going to be fantastic. It's going to allow me to do so much more content sharing with you, just the ease that it works at, okay? I'm excited with it. You can probably tell uh, it's going to be good. I just love talking about cycling because in it as well, I want to do something new. I want to talk about some races and some pro riders. I want to look at some techniques. I want to look at some incidents. I want to look at kit. I want to look at equipment. I want to look at training methods. I want to share with you some of the lab results that I get. And it's much easier for me in there, okay? Because the site is for people who love the struggle. They embrace the fitness journey. Remember, folks, there's only one off-season, and that's when you're dead. It's all over. Okay, now, my beautiful wife just appeared in the studio there, as she heard her name mentioned, uh, but she's not going to come on camera. She's too shy. So we will do that other video. 
Hey folks, I thank you very much if you have given the video a thumbs up. If you have subscribed to the channel, 72% of watchers of the channel are not subscribed. I bore you to death, but I think it's more to do with you just don't know where the button is. You've got to hit that subscribe button. Nothing will happen to you, you know. You won't get spammed. <laughs> the only spam we get on this show is usually from the porno girls, but they haven't appeared for quite a few weeks because I had to report them to the head teacher at YouTube. Okay, folks. Oh, wow. Michelle, Mount Vaughn 2 in July. Are you doing one climb? or several climbs. Mm. That is certainly a climb that I know some people have done the four, even five in a day. Yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, I've never done it. Why have I never done Mount Vaughan 2? It sits way down there, is it? In, it's in Provence. So it sits on its own. So you got to make a special pilgrimage to it, unlike many of the others where you can jump between them and you can spend time. If anybody's never been and is looking to go to, say, the Alps, there is a village, and I'll probably pronounce it badly, Borg saint Maurice, and it's a high village. In fact, it sits around about the height of Ben Nevis, and it's fantastic for getting to a lot of climbs, and you can do 50 to 100 kilometer rides from that, that village. It's probably not a village, it's probably a small town, Borg saint Maurice. I probably pronounced it wrong, but it is unbelievable, okay? Many climbs, Michelle. Love it. Okay. Hey, folks. I hope all is good. I'm going to jump off now. Please stay in touch with me. Let me know what type of content you want. You'll see that that poll's run. If you've taken part in the poll, thank you very much. I'm looking at making sure that I address what the audience wants without the use of a million videos that get sent to me how to use GPT. Is that, have I pronounced it right? Intelligence, artificial intelligence chat. Okay. I think some cyclists could actually do with artificial intelligence chat. I'm always saying to people, your chat is shit. Okay. <laughs> but I love you anyway. Hey folks. Okay. You take care and don't forget anyone can train smart. But there's only a few of us. No, anyone can train hard. <laughs> There's only a few of us can train smart. Keep your questions coming in and you stay safe and I'll see you in the next video.